Having spent several months now slowly crossing the U.S. to the Pacific coast, only two states now separated me from Canada, those of Oregon and Washington. Though time in each was relatively short, I had many memorable adventures. Oregon will be remembered for its rivers, Washington for its mountains. Today I'm on the banks of the Mackenzie River and plan on doing a paddle downstream for the next eight miles or so. This river presently is up quite high. It is a sustained class two all the way, so there's not gonna be much in the way of breaks over that period. The Mackenzie River was flowing fast today and at over six miles an hour, I covered the day's objective mileage in an hour and a quarter. A short trip by the usual standards, where you might average 10 to 15 leisurely miles in a day with breaks along the way. The Mackenzie did not offer you the luxury of leisure or breaks, with no good opportunities for eddying out. Once on the river, you're committed to its flow and simply along for the ride. A more advanced and confident paddler may well have glided down here with ease, but the turbulent waters and constant navigation through sizable waves meant it was quite a physical workout for me. But so much fun nonetheless, and a very exciting river indeed. And what a pleasure it was to go from the cold mountain waters of the Mackenzie to the delightful warmth of Cougar Natural Hot Spring high up in the mountains. A couple of days later, I was on the North Santiam River, and unlike the full-on Mackenzie experience, this was by standards a much more normal river with a variety of water conditions and occasional larger, more challenging sections. This time, I had the good fortune to find some paddling buddies willing to take me along on their day's adventure. Jen, Dan, Crystal and Nate were all very experienced paddlers, fun companions and familiar with this section of river. So this is called Spencer's Hole. This is class three. Pull on. And just to prove it wasn't a fluke, I did it again. It was instructive to follow their lead and have the added safety net of numbers. Traveling in a group in this fashion was confidence building and allowed me an opportunity to tackle some larger whitewater objectives than I may have as a solo boater. Risk was minimized and reward maximized. Through three class three rapids, I remained in my boat the entire time. The Columbia River plays a hugely important role in Pacific Northwest affairs and is the lifeblood of agriculture, power generation, river commerce, and a vital waterway for many fish populations. Barge traffic extends almost 500 miles inland to Lewiston, Idaho. This is a view of the huge Bonneville Dam from the Washington State side of the Columbia River. The central spillway allows for the upper river behind the dam to flow freely through sluice gates down the 60 feet to the lower section. What used to exist here before the dam tamed the river was a four mile long section of tumultuous rapids where indigenous peoples historically dip netted for salmon, a staple of their community life. Of course, security is always a big factor at a place like this. 
So I'm really quite surprised they do tours. Not all water is captured and used in power generation, and not all turbines are running continuously. Because they have no way of storing excess power, the turbines only produce enough to meet demand. The original dam on the Oregon side has a total of 10 turbines, while the more recent expansion on the Washington side in 1982 added an additional eight. In total, there are 14 dams along the length of the Columbia River, three of which are in Canada, and the Bonneville Dam, for all its formidable size and capacity, is far from being the biggest. The walls of the dam are 40 feet thick, and the flow of water down to the spinning propeller at the base of the turbine is controlled by wicket gates, essentially doors that are hydraulically opened and closed as required. A series of fish ladders permit returning salmon, shad and other species, such as the prehistoric lamprey eel, to navigate their way upstream and return to native spawning grounds. The Bonneville Dam was an unexpected stop along my route. Fascinating and informative, in addition to being an impressive piece of engineering. Next, it's on to Mount Adams, one of the Washington Cascades' four big volcanoes. Mount Adams is my destination for the next couple of days, ostensibly to do some hiking but also to check out a route to the summit for a future attempt. Welcome to Mount Adams, where I did say yesterday that I was just coming up here for a couple of days to do some hiking, but it's a big mountain. And there's just something about big mountains that I just really am attracted to. I went up there yesterday to do an initial uh, kind of scoping of the area and see what the route looked like. It's 7,000 feet from the trailhead to the summit. And that's a huge, huge undertaking for anybody in really good shape. And I am, quite frankly, um, I've done no training for this. I've effectively coming straight off the couch. Plus there is the added altitude that you have to deal with. And that slows you down as you gain in elevation. So I elected, I think wisely, to break it up into two stages where I will go up to around 9,000 feet and camp the night. I'm taking my sleeping bag and bivy sack and I'll just kind of bed down there for a few hours, get some rest. And around three in the morning, I will get up under headlight and start up for the summit, probably looking at a, at, a, at a summiting around dawn or thereabouts, maybe seven in the morning. It is another little over 3,000 feet from that uh, high camp to the summit. And then I will come all the way back down to the trailhead, pick up the motorcycle again, and return to the van here down at around 2,500 feet. Well, it's uh, two in the afternoon, and we're making pretty good progress. I'm certainly in no hurry today to get up to um, the resting place for this evening because there's not a lot to do up there except bed down for the night. And uh, I'd say I'm going to be up there in the next couple of hours, so it's still going to be early. Um, I did meet a couple of climbers coming down who said that they got turned back this morning because of very high winds. So hopefully tomorrow morning we'll be a little more forgiving and uh, the mountain will permit us access. Well, that was a successful climb. We're up at 9,000 feet and we still have another 3,500 feet to go tomorrow morning. So um, it's about 5.30 in the afternoon and finally just settling down for the evening. I'm going to have a quick bite to eat. Pretty much go to bed. I've got to tell you a quick story about these boots. Great pair of boots, really rugged, well-made, but they cause me blisters. In fact, the last time I wore them, I was up on Mount Baker, which is another one of these <coughs> Cascades volcanoes about a couple of hundred miles north of here. And I ended up with 
completely raw heels on account of wearing these boots. And um, I stopped in on that particular trip to pay a visit to my friend Jessica in Seattle. And of course, she gave me all sorts of tips and pointers on what to do to prevent that in the future. Now, two days from now, I am meeting up with Jessica a few miles up the road on Mount Rainier to go and do some hiking. She is not going to believe my story when I tell her I both climbed this mountain and I've got blisters on my heels again on account of it. Well, it's quarter to five in the morning. I've been out here on the trail for the last hour and a half. Sun is just starting to come up and uh, it's chilly and there's a bit of a bit of a wind blowing right now. That right in front of you is what is called Piker's Peak. That's the false summit. That is what we have been looking at all along on the journey up so far. It's not the true summit. That's probably another hour or so further on. This is about a 40 degree snow slope. It's pretty steep. The wind sculpts the snow in all sorts of very strange and wonderful ways. Well, I am standing on the top of Mount Adams. And this weather just blew in in the last 10 minutes. So, no view. I guess I could sit it out for a little while and see if anything changes. I don't know. I think right behind me there is Mount Rainier. Oh yeah, there we go. Things are changing. Damn, it's cold. I gotta put my glove on. Well, there you go. Well, look at that. We actually have a circular rainbow there. That's Mount St. Helens. Over here, Mount Hood. And Mount Rainier. Well, what do you know? We made it. Woohoo! Now we've got 7,000 feet to go down back to the motorcycle. Well, it's 2.30 in the afternoon and I'm just coming down off the mountain and heading back to the van. But you can clearly see that there's been a distinct change in the weather since I was up there this morning. That's a big lenticular cloud that's hanging over the summit which means there is a lot of fast moving air. So whatever I had to put up with this morning is nothing compared to with what is going on up there presently. And generally these are a harbinger of change in the weather and oftentimes not for the better. So I pity the poor folks making the effort up there today. Next, it's up into British Columbia, Canada and a long-anticipated visit to the islands of Haida Gwaii. Stay tuned for this upcoming postcard from Roads and Rivers.